Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, again, it's really nice to be on a, an interdisciplinary um, kind of panel because I always feel like a, the odd person in the room with like, what I really know um, about big data. Um, but what I do know and how we've encountered it in the Neuropolitics Lab came in a really um, big blast of why people are really concerned about artificial intelligence. Um, Miss and disinformation, and, and um, uh, in our case, we were having a look at, at fake news and how that can be transmitted in social media as well. So, in the Neuropolitics Research Lab, we use a mixture of um, cognitive uh, neuroscience approaches and social computational analysis to try and get under the hood a little bit of some of the kind of political decision making that. Um, that, that occurs and to really try and understand what motivates that in ways that we haven't traditionally been able to do with, with the methods that we, we, we use. Um, and we've been following in particular um, the Brexit debate and collecting um, a, 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 a very large, I think one of the largest data sets from August 2015 till now on Twitter on the conversation on Twitter, trying to look at the cognitive patterns and the way that the information was transmitted um, in relation to the Brexit debate. And by chance, um, as we are developing this and working away on what might be happening in Brexit, Twitter releases um, their list of um, accounts that they had identified in relation to the US election as being active um, from the, the so-called Russian troll farm, the IRA, um, in trying to meddle with the US election. And they had um, subsequently identified these accounts, uh, issued a, a list to the Senate. And Claire um, Llewellyn, who um, works in the, the lab, um, got a call from a journalist saying, any of these in your account? We went looking and here we ended up with this massive spread of quite sensational, in some cases, articles, and that comes to the second point of my, um, I guess, my talk, which is that, obviously, the transmission of information, even in the traditional media, never mind the social media, never mind in the big data format, is often quite far from the actual quite nuanced reality. So in reality, what we found was that, yes, indeed, these IRA accounts had tweeted on Brexit, but in comparison to the number of tweets that one has on Brexit, it was in fact a tiny number. So while this was really, really interesting that they were there, it was actually quite a tiny number. And we've subsequently, um, with Robin, who's here, um, who's also design informatics, and Adrian, our, our graduate assistant, just um, published an article where we look in a more nuanced way at what actually happened. And the story, for those who are interested, is that actually these were, although they were talking about Brexit, very few of them were targeted specifically at Brexit until right on the day of the election and subsequent days um, around the referendum. In fact, it looks like they were targeting the US election, they were targeting the German election, and Brexit was part of the peripheral noise and it was part of disrupting the system. So why is that relevant today? Well, for us, the relevance of, oh, it didn't do my lovely thing. Well, they come up as slides rather than as, yeah, never mind. Okay, um, so um, for us, the relevance here is that these feed into what is happening in terms of the public discussion, in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of big data, and what the role that it plays in the world. So it's lovely to have Lillian talk about um, the Cambridge Analytica, because I don't have to go in and talk about that. But basically, what is emerging in the world of politics is a deep sense of insecurity, a deep sense of fear about what information can be trusted, the sources of information that is being pushed towards them, and what has happened as people are having these fearful conversations, we're emerging with a sense of what they often call ontological insecurity, a real sense of um, uncertainty about our place in the world and about the things that are happening around us, which makes it very, very difficult to make rational decisions on politics. And what we find is in terms of the way in which the individual who's having to make political decisions and act in, in a, a rational manner in terms of their voting practice is that they have, um, are being bombarded in the conversation 
by a whole series of understandings of big data, artificial intelligence, which are, are not always um, entirely clear to them. So that there's a kind of ongoing notion that net and dark net might be something a bit sinister um, somewhere there. That news can't be trusted because it's all fake news um, and that that gets transmitted through social media. Social media is really bringing us this, this big data is bringing us this fake news. These bots, these bots are bringing us all this fake news and it's all coming. Now of course the elements of that, as you all know, are of course true, but we also know that we need to really, really view that in context because this has very real implications. It's not just what's happening at the Cambridge Analytica level in terms of what is being pushed towards people, the algorithms that are taking it to them. It's also how people feel about that coverage. This now fear that, oh, I might have been exposed to these messages. I don't know if I was exposed to them or not. I don't know if that's influenced my voting behaviour. I don't know if what I read in this piece of information was true or accurate. I don't know who to trust. Oh, that none of them are none of them are trustworthy. Perhaps I won't vote at all. And all of these kind of messages are really, really significant and play a really significant role in the voting public. Throw into that the Russians <laughs> ignite the Cold War fears and then you turn them into Russian bots and Russian trolls and we really have a borderline hysteria in what's being understood from the politics perspective. And of course we have to think about these stories. So what we know today and we know today and you guys know is that these tools can be used for good or for ill. They're tools. And we've seen precisely in the, the, the conversations that and both Cami and Lillian were giving us how these tools need to be better understood and how they need to be better regulated. But we also need to be really sure that people are not just data literate, but are able to make some kind of judgment about how worried or scared one ought to be and whether everything is, in fact, dark and scary. Because when we live, and this is a lovely, um, um, term from a, 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 um, a political scientist who looked originally at international organisation and how we organise and come together as communities, as states, and international organisations, and talked about how when we find ourselves in conditions of turbulence, that has an enormous effect on every part of our policy making. So when people feel that they're in a turbulent field, it's a bit like being in this giant simultaneous chess match over which the, the judges have lost control. And that's a very, very scary place to be. It's a scary place for the policy makers, it's a scary place for the politicians, it's a scary place for us as the public or as the voters. Um, because solutions get put forward, but each solution seems to maybe need some unpicking of something else or something new or something that we're not understanding very well. Um, and although, uh, um, exactly as Elian said, people are now using the term algorithm all the time, what they really understand by that is, you know, is it a positive, is it a negative, is it simply a tool that could be either, isn't, isn't already clear. Um, and here, I suppose I wanted to use a little bit of, and I'm nearly done, a little bit of, of context for us as, uh, from a political science and public society perspective, that to some extent, some of the, the stories that we're hearing in terms of the way that fake news, disinformation, misinformation is being transmitted in social media, um, the fear of the bots and the fear of these new platforms, it's a little bit like the story of old wine in new bottles. You know, originally when the printing press came in, that was a really feared thing as well. So we have to, to pay, I think, um, a really important message from us, from the political science point of view, looking at this and its effect on society, is the notion of a, taking a little pause for reflection and viewing some of these things in context. Because in this very, very turbulent, fear-driven, insecure environment, quite difficult for people to make rational evaluations of these tools. Sam Fine, uh, Murray Edelman rather, um, wrote um, this book in the 1970s, The Politics of Misinformation. And when he was talking about misinformation, he wasn't talking about new technologies, bots, artificial intelligence. He was talking about the way in which the democratic elite, the establishment, used misinformation to the public to dress up their democratic procedures as benefiting everybody when they were pretty well benefiting the elites. 
And one of the things that can be argued to have happened as the democratisation of access to some of these platforms has taken place is some of that power has been removed from those elites. And that's quite a scary place. And so it becomes very easy, as you see the kind of cracks in the edifice of democracy, to blame the populace, the bots, the algorithms, the fake news. And, and really what has happened in some places is that voices that never traditionally got heard have got access through some of these platforms. So again, there are other elements that we, we might look at. And in case we think that micro-targeting, the Cambridge Analytica um, tactic, is something new, censuses have been used to do this for years and years and years. You gave over your census information, and most of us didn't even realise we ticked the box that said it was all right to use um, our information um, to target things at us. Traditionally, I was on another panel with uh, Marco Biaggi, one of the um, previously um, in the, the Parliament, um, and one of the things he talked about was, in the past, in the Conservative Party manual, they were told that what they should do in terms of micro-targeting was immediately get out the phone book, look for all the taxi drivers and the hairdressers, because they would be your influencers. Go and talk to those people and get that message out. And traditionally, every political party has chosen some doors to knock on and not knocked on other doors. So while, yes, we are seeing a difference in scale, we're perhaps not seeing a complete difference in approach. And I think that's also important in telling um, that story. Likewise, we all know the way in which bots are used to facilitate lots of things in our lives that aren't terribly scary. And of course, the, the dark net is often used by progressive campaign groups who don't want somebody observing what they're doing. So I think the, the main message um, that um, we would give over from a political science perspective of looking at this is partly to take some kind of historical context and partly to consider what is the effect of fear and hype and to make sure that we're, we're, we're cautious in, in recognising that there can be misuse but that actually exacerbating fear about some of these technologies and uh, creating a kind of bots under the bed um, kind of fear is actually what allows real disinformation <coughs> to take place because what it's trying to do is cause turbulence and unrest. It's not usually targeted from one side or another of politics. It's usually meant to make people scared and to mistrust the governments and structures around them. Um, I'll leave it.